Are you not the least bit curious about the contents? Near replicant for 1.22474487139 is set in a post-apocalyptic future after a disease has ravaged humanity. It is so far in the future that society has looped back to a medieval-like state, making for a truly unique setting in which our present is considered ancient and aspects of our past are the present. In Nier, the protagonist is seeking a way to cure his sister from a disease known as the Black Scroll. The story really is the main motivation for playing, so even though it's the most important part of the game, I won't go into any detail here in order to keep this as spoiler free as possible. I'll summarise briefly by saying that it's unique, compelling, and deals in emotions that generally range from devastating at worst to melancholic at best. The game has a memorable cast of characters. Most notable are Grimoire Vice, a pompous talking book, Kaine, a potty mouth woman in fine underwear, and Emil, a gentle and kind noble boy with the gaze of a gorgon. They are all such different characters with extremely different backgrounds, making the friendship they form and the interactions between both them and the protagonist all the more special. Vice! Vice! Good to see you, Kaine. Although I don't think anyone has ever accused me of being a little bitch before. <laughs> and you, we meet again. You'll even feel a deep connection with Yona, the protagonist's little sister, despite her not really having all that much screen time. This is partly due to her diary entries appearing in the loading screens, adding additional detail to the kind of relationship she and the protagonist share. For further reading on the story and characters, a book named Grimoire Nier was released in Japan only, but a translation is available online. I'll share a link in the description below. Of particular note is a story named Witch's Sabbath, which clearly explains why Kaine was mistreated and labelled a freak by the villagers. This is something that's only vaguely hinted at in the main game. The voice acting is top notch and this is especially true of Vice and Kaine. Their petty squabbles are something I can never get tired of. Shut the hell up before I tear off your arms, ram a stick up your ass and turn you into a kebab! Keep her away from me! That you were able to restrain that hooligan with words alone is testament to your vulgar speech and vile character. Cram it up your index, book. Also, on the audio side of things, the soundtrack is one of the best in any game I've ever played, and there's really nothing else quite like it, aside from perhaps in Neo Automata. The tracks are beautiful but have a strange sadness to them, which really fits the tone of the game. Game director Yako Taro specifically requested that the soundtrack would be heavy on vocals, but to ensure that they don't clash with the main dialogue, or deliver lyrical messaging that would otherwise be at odds with certain scenes, these vocals are in a made-up language. This made up language is comprised from sounds from various languages that vocalist Emmy Evans has encountered, and serves as a sort of approximation of what a language in the far distant future might sound like. The side quests in Nier feel very well integrated and justified in a way that's quite rare. Since the protagonist was raised as an orphan by the villagers, he feels that he owes them, so taking on odd jobs for small payments is part of who he is as a character, and it's implied that he's been doing this since long before the start of the game. The protagonist's over-eagerness to help everybody gets referenced quite a few times in a self-aware way in the form of comments from Vice and even the quest givers themselves. Hey, I know you. You're that kid who takes any job. No matter how weird or demeaning. Not really how I'd phrase it, but okay. The game's pacing also ensures that taking on side quests feels like the right thing to be doing at that moment. It also gets around a problem that other games often have, a side quest can break immersion due to them not really aligning with the character's motivations. Like why would I be running fetch quests when I need to be saving the world? After a while, the side quests do start to become a little bit tedious. This is especially true when they have multiple steps, since their progress doesn't carry over into the next playthrough if you don't complete all the steps. There are multiple endings that are unlocked by completing back-to-back -back playthroughs. You could call these routes, however with a single exception where a route will branch right at the end, it's basically linear. There's a single path through route A that goes straight into a single path through route B, and so on and so forth. Luckily, routes B to D will start around halfway through the game, which does help prevent them from becoming too tedious. The route B to D playthroughs, while adding some additional depth, are far too similar to route A gameplay-wise, especially considering that even within a single route, certain areas must be revisited multiple times for both the main quest and side quests, and the locations and dungeons don't change on each visit be fighting exactly the same waves of enemies in exactly the same patterns, and the core combat really isn't compelling enough to stop this from getting boring quickly. The re-release also has a new ending route, Route E. All I'll say here is that it's very different from the others. Just now I briefly touched on how the combat isn't really that compelling. 
quite simplistic and lends itself to being button mashy. But it does look smooth and has a real liquid flowing feel to it, but without any of the depth found in hack and slash games like Bayonetta. The standout feature of the combat is the use of Grimoire Vice for magic attacks. There are quite a few different spells, or sealed verses as the game calls them, each with different utility. For example, the Dark Lance can be charged and released at range, the Dark Gluttony can absorb magic attacks and fire them back as a beam of energy, and the Dark Execution can impale enemies within an area of effect. The Dark Blaster serves a special mention here as you'll always want to have this equipped. It allows for a steady stream of weak, ranged magic attacks, and unlike the other spells, is independent of the player's animations. What this means in practice is that the player can keep firing while dodging, blocking, and even while attacking. There are some unique and creative gameplay elements that really stood out to me. One is how the camera forces itself into different positions at different points in the game, making it feel like the game is switching to a totally different genre. For example, side on like a platformer, or top down like a bullet hell shooter. There's also a section that takes you through various text-based adventures, one of which involves navigating a maze-like castle in a certain number of moves. I actually had to reach for a pen and paper for this section and draw out a map. When Nier was first released in Japan, the PS3 version was Nier Replicant and the Xbox 360 version was Nier Gestalt. Outside of Japan, however, only the Gestalt version was released on both consoles. This Gestalt version of the game features a different protagonist, this time Yona's father. It's great that the remake is based on the Replicant version, since this is a new perspective for players in the West. However, the father-daughter relationship felt like a much tighter bond than that of the brother and sister. He also just looks way cooler, the brother protagonist's visual design really doesn't appeal to me. I played the PC version from day one and had quite a few issues. The mouse cursor was always present during cutscenes, even though I was playing with a controller. And while the game ran fine and at a solid 60 FPS for the most part, every now and then I encountered an issue where the frame rate would drop below 1 FPS, what seemed like over an entire minute. By default, the frame rate is actually uncapped, and some aspects of the gameplay and animations are tied to this. For example, movement. What this means is that on beefier PCs, the game runs too fast and becomes difficult to control. I had some serious input lag issues that I suspect may have been related to this. In case these issues still haven't been resolved by Square Enix, I'll leave a link to a mod that should help. As always, I was impressed by the little details that this game has. Here are a few of my favourites. The vocals in the Village soundtrack are mixed based on proximity to Devola. After meeting Grimoire Vice, the menu UI changes to the form of a book. When killing shades, blood splatters appear and muffled human-like cries are released. I highly recommend it based on its merits of really being one of the most unique games out there. This is apparent in its story, soundtrack, game design and overall vibe. It's a game that really stuck with me in the years since I first played the original, and I'd imagine that the same would be true of Near Replicant for those experiencing it for the first time. It's kind of fun, in a weird way. <laughs>